This is one of the barracks recently vacated by the British Army in Northern Ireland. And underneath it lies one of the most important strongholds in medieval Ireland, the castle of the Earls of Tyrone. In the year 1602, it became one of the top targets for an advancing English army. It was a bloody battle, and as you can see from this contemporary picture, it ended up half destroyed with the English flag on top of it. This picture is a snapshot of a battle that changed the course of history. Time Team has been given just three days to investigate a site that changed the history of Ireland and Britain for centuries. So, no pressure then. We've been invited to Dungannon by the local council because they've just been given ownership of a very special scheduled monument, one of the most important historical sites in Northern Ireland. They're now in the process of turning this ex-barracks into a public park, and our job is to find the remains of this crucial medieval castle. Home of the O'Neills, one of the major dynasties that ruled the north of Ireland for 300 years. Oh, and before you ask, that's not part of it. It's just one of a load of things that have been built here since the castle was destroyed. Hey, Mick, there's a rag bag of stuff here, isn't there? You've got this massive wall, you've got those towers up there, you've got this huge mast up here, <laughs> and all this concrete. How the heck are we going to find a castle? Well, one of our best clues is this nice prospect look of, of early 1600s by Bartlett, which shows a great tower, walls, moats around it. We don't quite know where this is on the top of the hill, and we don't know what the orientation of it is, but there's a, clearly something big here. Is there any evidence at all, though? Yeah, there was. At the time whenever this perimeter fence was being constructed, there was a series of evaluation pits excavated, and in the process of that, they came across a wall which seemed to be medieval. So they also were coming across pottery dating back to the 12th century. So there is evidence here of a castle. So we got some clues, Phil. <laughs> we got some clues, but what we need to do is try and get a bigger area yeah. so we can actually rediscover these walls and actually try and, and, and find out what buildings were there and also the phasing, there's just loads and loads of occupation up here. So, rip up the concrete? We've got yep. to get the disc cutter in, rip up the concrete and then we go down. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> well, finding a castle's the sort of thing that Geophys was invented for, but surveying next to a communications mast has somewhat scuppered the high-tech approach. So we're not going to see below a metre. Radio interference means John can barely see below the surface. Undeterred, we still have a few tricks up our sleeve. They are left one corner. We know bits of possible medieval wall were found when this fence was built, and the evidence suggests they belong to two walls running roughly at right angles to each other. So in theory, they should meet up here in the middle of the compound which is where we're going to put our first trench. And with any luck, we'll find ourselves an Irish fortress that once looked something like this. Basically, the castle's a subspecies of castle. It's a tower house. Right. Which are very popular in Ireland during the late medieval period. In the tower house, each of the rooms is stacked, one above the other, right. all the way up to the parapet level. Yeah. So and, 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 and I mean, how, how about the thickness of the walls? What sort of thickness would they be? Well, the thickness of the walls, they vary. They could be two, two and a half metres. This is coming up to three metres, which is fairly big. Well, a three metre thick wall's one heck of a target. In fact, I imagine it'll be rather hard to miss. Want to come on in then, Ian? Lovely job. And if we do find it, we'll be back to medieval Ireland.
a time when the country was divided into four great territories. And for centuries, Dungannon was at the heart of the ancient Irish province of Ulster, of which modern-day Northern Ireland is just a part. The town was so important because from the beginning of the 14th century, it was the power base of the O'Neills, the Irish clan that dominated and controlled Ulster until the English army seized their castle in 1602, an event commemorated in the local museum. You know what strikes me about this place, talking to local people here today, is how significant they think it is. Why? What's so important about it? Well, Dungannon here was the seat of the O'Neill family. The O'Neills claim the most ancient lineage in Europe and remained independent here in Ulster. And the first mention of Dungannon in a historical text is when O'Neill in 1317 writes to the Pope complaining about English rule in Ireland. So in a sense, by the time the Tudors come, the O'Neills are still resisting English rule uh, led by Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone. So is that why this castle was such a target for the English soldiers? Because they saw it as a symbol of Irish people's resistance to English rule at that time? Absolutely. So the English burned the castle down? Well, no, the English didn't burn the castle down. O'Neill burned this castle down himself and pulled down its walls to prevent the English using it as a garrison in his own territory. This picture, painted by English cartographer Richard Bartlett in 1602, portrays the beginning of the English dominance of Ulster. But it also provides clues to what was here before those fateful events of 1602, because the archaeologists believe Bartlett has recorded the old Irish settlement on the hill. What they really are, small, maybe five, six metres long, upside landed houses, crook roofs. Mm -hmm. and typical, as we would say, Irish cabins. Those buildings are very rarely found in archaeology right. in Northern Ireland. I can think of maybe two that have been found. So if we could manage to hit one or two of these buildings, it would be like gold dust for us. Well, we can't resist a bit of gold dust, so we're going to start surveying the slope of the hill to see if it does include any remains of the Irish settlement. We're also opening a trench over a very obvious large earthwork. To discover if it's part of the inner castle defence or the moated outer defences around the Irish town shown by Bartlett. Digging this trench is a joy, like a warm knife cutting through butter. The same can't be said up at the castle trench. Oh, what's the hell, sir? Is that another lane? It turns out that where we think two medieval walls connect is under almost a metre of reinforced army mortarproof concrete. Even our most powerful digger can't get through it. And that means we've had to move our trench to an area covered by softer tarmac. It should still be over medieval archaeology, but it's bitterly disappointing for Phil. I'm going to have to get rid of that. We also have some problems over at our possible Irish town. Dungannon was burnt down a number of times during the 15 and 1600s, and since then, this hill's been re-landscaped for gardens and then by the military. All of which means the geophys results are somewhat challenging. But John thinks he does have something that could be evidence of a settlement. It right. looks like rubbish pits, areas of burning. Um, well, I'd hope settlement-type features. I think if we excavate that, see if we can get some dating material, then it will give us a wider idea of what's going on. But, I mean, burning, this place has burnt down so many times, hasn't it, Paul? Mm. We're not going to know where that fits, are we? Well, we know, basically, if we're getting a lot of burning, that's going to place us somewhere at least in the first half of the 17th century, if not back. So burning's good. As long as it's archaeological and it's burning, we're on the right track. So can you mark that out on the ground for us? <laughs> ah. <laughs> So our third trench goes in to find evidence of the Irish settlement. <laughs> no, 
Oh. Ah. Oh. But the big news is up at the Castle Trench, where we've just found our first bit of O'Neill-era archaeology. Oh, yes! Well done. OK, make that our first two bits of O'Neill-era archaeology. Oh, that's a bit more like it, isn't it? Yeah. Is that the same bit? I think it possibly does. I'll give it to you, maybe a bit safer, and see if it fits on the bottom, is it? It's just saying it's the rim, isn't it? Is it very yeah. nice. Do you remember that bit? It looks like we could have intact archaeology back here now to the, what, 16th, 17th century? Yeah. So that's good. Whoa, I like that. This lovely piece of pot is from a flagon dating to the end of the 16th century. But what truly makes it significant is that it was made in Western Germany. It's from there that Hugh O'Neill received shipments of gunpowder as tensions grew between his desire to control Ulster and the English desire for control over the whole of Ireland. The English Crown was concerned that Ireland could be used as a launch pad for invasion by its European enemies and tried to gain influence over the Irish rulers through a mixture of force and favour. Con O'Neill received the first earldom of Tyrone from Henry VIII in London in 1542. He was to anglicise Ulster, but that plan went awry. And consequently, it was left to his grandson, Hugh O'Neill, who was made the second Earl of Tyrone by Queen Elizabeth in 1587. It was left to him to anglicise Ulster. But that relationship with the Crown once again went very badly wrong. Anglicisation meant accepting the English monarch as supreme ruler, accepting English law and accepting the Protestant religion. O'Neill resisted the move, leading a revolt and courting the Catholic Spanish. But by the summer of 1602, the English were closing in and O'Neill's fortress at Dungannon was attacked from all sides. The English forces in Ulster rendezvous here in the vicinity of Dungannon. Dukra, a man who'd been sent to Derry to establish a garrison behind English lines, he arrives from the west. Chichester, who was uh, governor of Carrick Fergus, who had established himself on Loch Ney, he comes across Loch Ney. And Mountjoy, the Lord Deputy, advances up the Blackwater Valley. So, in fact, O'Neill was really being hemmed in on that Absolutely. Sides. And uh, he scarpered. He retreated into the woods in what is now South Derry, a large oak wood called Glen Conkeen. The English pursued the fleeing local population with extreme brutality, as the victorious Lord Mountjoy organised raiding parties to kill any Irish found hiding in the woods. It was the beginning of the end for the traditional Irish settlement on this site. But Bridge thinks she's beginning to find evidence of that original town of Dungannon. This feature here, can you see this with the dark brown soil? It's running around and it's curving. Right. It could be something to do with drainage, but more tantalising, it could be a cabin. Right. Now, do you remember Bartlett's map? There's those oval houses yes. on it with the yeah. thatched roofs. Something like this could be indicative of foundations for one of those cabins. Yeah. This feature, along with what looks like a possible drain, certainly gives us plenty to look forward to tomorrow. Oh! Up on the top of the hill, Phil's at last made a breakthrough. Two metres below the tarmac, he may just have found our first evidence of O'Neill's castle. The wall that was supposed to be coming through here, do yeah. you know what, what its construction was? Um, it was faced on both sides and you had a, a rubble core. It's, it's going down, yeah, and it's also coming this way. I mean, I think this is by far and away the most encouraging thing we got so far. Yeah, absolutely. There's also been a breakthrough down in Matt's trench. Where are we on this map, Matt? Well, this morning we opened it up, assuming that we were on this kind of bank round here that the tower was sitting on, across there. But as you can see down here, I'm going almost ankle deep in water. We've got this huge wet ditch. So could that be this moat here? I'm thinking we could be actually on the moat, yeah. Well, that's quite useful, isn't it? Because if that's the moat there, then that would imply that something relating to these houses might be just yeah, over there. Yeah, that position, all those buildings there, up above me on the, on the plateau. So now we've got Matt on the moat and Bridge somewhere in amongst the Irish settlement. 
But there's a bit of a problem. When we use the archaeology to position the Bartlett picture on the modern landscape, our best match puts the castle somewhere here, a long way away from Phil's trench. Which makes you wonder what on earth have Phil and Colm found. Is that stone down there significant? Well, um... <laughs> What's this? Oh, well, <laughs> looking at each other like... Six form girls in the cloakroom. There's a certain amount of disagreement here, Tony. We're both agreed that that is part of a wall. I believe that's part of a demolished wall that has literally been dumped in here. Calm, on the other hand. I'm hopeful that it's the, the wall that was picked up in the evaluation trench behind you when the uh, great big metal upright was being put in place. Phil, why are you so sceptical? The one good archaeological find that we've had out of that trench is this flagon. What date is this? It's probably late 16th, 17th century. Right date. I don't have any problems about the 16th, 17th century date. Where I have a problem is agreeing that that is a part of the wall that runs through there. How are we going to find out who's right? Dig on down. So, do we have our first clue about where the castle might be? In order to find that out, we're going to have to get into some serious civil engineering. It's the beginning of day two in Northern Ireland. And as the sun rises, you can understand why the Clan O'Neill, one of the most powerful families in ancient Ulster, chose this hill to build their castle. Although I have to say yesterday, we couldn't find hide nor hair of the castle until the very last moment when Phil got this one stone which he thought might be part of a wall and he said, don't worry, I'll do some more digging for you tomorrow. He seems to have started shifting tons of this hardcore which presumably the British Army used when they were turning this into an army compound. Bit of a problem for health and safety though. Well, we'll just have to be careful getting on the night of the trench. But that, that, that's another reason why we've taken out so much of a bigger area. Sorry, a typical bit of Northern Irish understatement. <laughs> what? We're just going to have to be a bit careful <laughs> getting in and out of this great mire of stone. But you see, that's uh, to our advantage in terms of safety, because if we do make the, the, the hole much bigger, yeah. it means that the sides are that much safer. Can I get in? Yeah, yeah. Because yesterday you got a bit excited about this stone down here, didn't you? That's right. I mean, we're still uncertain as to whether it's part of the wall or whether it's rubble. But if you look down to your left, you'll see a little white stone poking through. There's one here. Now, that is totally different from all the army hardcore around it. And it's just possible, just possible, that that is another stone of the wall poking up through. It's more or less on exactly the same line, but it's very early to say. Can I have a hand out? No, you've got in there. You get yourself out. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, not much time team spirit there, but I have to give it to Phil. He does seem to be on the money. Look now, one stone there, and we got another stone there. Look, there's another stone there, and another stone there. 
So literally we've got the, the, the front wall. edge of a wall mm -hmm. running along there. We're hoping to find a large wall that lines up with some medieval remains uncovered when this compound was built. And Phil's wall would fit the bill perfectly, except... One problem. What? The alignment of it. Well, I don't know it. Phil's wall is going in completely the wrong direction. It's not a problem, it's a, it's a fact. <laughs> let, let, let's say it was unexpected. Unexpected alignment. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree, I agree. It's yeah. not supposed to be doing that. No. <laughs> well, at least the rest of the dig seems to be going to plan, tying in nicely with this 1602 picture of an embattled O'Neill's castle falling to the English troops of Lord Mountjoy. Matt's trench has done its job and located the moat. While our third trench has been targeted on the settlement. Oh, hang on. Ah! Oh, oh hey! <laughs> yeah. At last! And the archaeology suggests we're now in among the houses of the original Irish town. Tracy's dug a slot down the side just to get the relationship between this small gully and these pile of stones. And she's, she's actually hit this, this fill layer, which seems to have lots of domestic items in there. So we're getting bone, charcoal flakes, and our first piece of pottery. Oh. It dates from medieval to the 17th century, which is oh. slap bang in the middle of our O'Neill family yeah. settlement yeah. here. Yeah. So um, the question is, is this a structure? I mean, how likely is it to be a house, you know? An early I house? I think it's too early to say, really. I mean, with this coming out and with your bone, Raksha's right, it looks like we're getting on to settlement. So if you look like collapsed stones, pottery, bone, we could be dealing with the structure. So we're going to extend this trench to work out what may be lurking under the surface. There's a really nice stone down here. Yeah, so I we're think coming down onto the top of the other one. Exactly, so yeah. that's the level we want there. I mean, they certainly look as though they're at right angles, don't yep. they? Coming off nicely at right angles. Yep. Up at the castle site, Phil and Colm have just discovered a second wall. Hopefully it'll meet up with this wall here. Well, that's a crucial thing, really, isn't it? The, the relationship. Of what, or at least what happens yeah. when that war hits that war. Yeah, well, hopefully what we find is that the two of them are bonded in together and then they're all one build. That's right. Well, it couldn't be going much better, really. Except Phil's walls don't seem to tie in with our early attempts to match the archaeology with the Bartlett map, which could put the castle on the other side of the hill. I can't help worrying that we keep trying to fit the archaeology in the ground onto one 400-year-old picture. Richard Bartlett was as much a war artist as a cartographer. He was quite plainly being employed to illustrate Mountjoy's victories. Do you think we can put much credence on it? I think so, because in other contexts, Bartlett's maps are remarkably accurate. This is a sort of panoramic view of the Blackwater Valley. And besides these, he was able to do maps of the whole region. Really, these uh, panoramas in particular, they're as good as anything on Google Earth. This guy was a remarkable cartographer. So like, why hasn't he filled in these panels? Well, he didn't fill those in because in a subsequent map making expedition to Donegal, he was killed. Uh, as the sources say, uh, the Irish took off his head because he was going to discover the country. So it would seem that we can take the spirit of this illustration at face value. Whether we can tie in Bartlett's view with the modern lie of the land may be another matter. I think we need to know, don't we, wh you know, where that wall is going. Yeah. yeah. Councillor War. Yes. Yeah, sort of dis big discussions. I mean, there's a lot going on. Like what? <laughs> We have a fairly thick wall here. Yeah. We have a thinner wall here. Um, it's possible, just possible, that what you've got is the outside wall of the tower house and maybe one of the internal uh, partitioning walls. The crucial thing is, Tony, is what's happening here. 
because you can see that the wall comes along and then it stops. And the reason it stops is that there's a big hole in there. We think it might be a ditch, we don't know. There's a big hole in there, but from that big hole, we had our one piece of pot, that big piece of German stoneware, 17th century. Hang on, hang on. If this ditch has got a 17th century find in it and it's cutting this wall, then that means that this wall is at the very latest 17th century. Clever old you. Don't patronise me, <laughs> Philip. You go right into that hole if you're not careful. We can't say for sure, though, that this is the castle, can we? No. What we need to do is to excavate in here, and if we find that that wall over here is bonded into this wall over here, then it's all one build. If it's one build, it's a f you have to try and then explain what type of floor plan you've got here. And the best thing would be that it's the inside of the tower house. So in spite of Bartlett suggesting the tower house is on one side of the hill, the archaeology does suggest we've got something big and, well, tower house-ish on the other side. And if this is part of the O'Neill Tower House, then we'll have discovered one of the most important buildings in the history of this island. Because the loss of this castle set in motion a series of events that sealed the fate of the O'Neills, eventually leading to the flight of the Earls. The flight of the Earls is a remarkable event in Irish history. Basically, the aristocracy of the whole province of Ulster leave in a single ship in 1607. Why did they go? This was the time uh, in your history of the uh, gunpowder plot. So there's a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment about? Yeah, and they feared there was a conspiracy against them. Uh, and uh, they heard news from Brussels uh, that if O'Neill uh, went to London where he'd been summoned to court, that if he went to London, he would be arrested and presumably put in the, the Tower of London. Uh, so they decided to pack up and leave suddenly and in complete secrecy. And once O'Neill relinquished Ulster, the landscape changed forever. Out went rural settlements, in came a very English sort of town. The way was open for an English plantation of Ulster where colonists uh, were brought in uh, to the country and transformed towns like this. And this place here is the result of English colonisation? Absolutely. This is a typical English marketplace. This area was granted to Chichester, one of the people who had fought the war against O'Neill, and he brought in English settlers, establishing uh, an Anglican church down here, a uh, courthouse up here, and he brought law and order, from his point of view, into the, this part of Ulster, and most importantly, a, a market economy was established. The result was that Ulster, the most Irish and Catholic province of Ireland, swiftly became the most British and Protestant. And Stuart believes that this hill contains some of that early British history. We've got a description by Pinard of a fort that was placed here for Chichester. And it actually gives us a drawing of it and a description of it. You see it's like a, a tower and it's got, it's like a star fort with bulwarks sticking out on the corner. And you can see he's drawn the town down below it in a road alongside. That's exactly what we've yeah. got here. And Chichester is one of Mountjoy's guys, so this would have been an English occupying castle. Mm. That, that's it, yeah. They've got the town below, they need to protect it with bastions, some way you can fire cannon and with muskets gun, from. Guns on them. Mate. That's right. Yeah. And this is the ideal location here yeah. with the town down, in the protection just down there. The trouble is we've got about 10 foot of overburden here. We can't, we've tried the geophysics, we can't get through it. So my idea was, well, what about round the edges? And if you look at this topographic survey that was done some time ago, you can see these earthworks here. Mm. That looks a bit like a, a half bulwark and, yeah. and sort of remnant of a fort. So if we go over the side there, that might be our best opportunity. So a new trench goes in to see if we can find the position of the English fort. Oh, wow, there's lots of charcoal. And that's below all that modern makeup, isn't it? The breeze blocks. And... and that means we're now investigating both the Irish and the British occupation of this hill. 
Because the feeling is that although we still can't pin the Bartlett map down to the modern landscape, we are digging O'Neill's tower house in Phil's trench. What we've got makes sense in terms of the base of a tower house. In what way? Well, the basic plan is something like that. So you get these thick walls with internal walls a lot thinner. And we're probably, we could easily be at somewhere like that junction there. So if that's the inside, as we're assuming, then the outside ought to have some sort of batter on it. What's a batter? Uh, it's the bit of wall that's at an angle before the main wall goes up. Oh, I know what you mean. You got, it goes up like that from yeah. the ground and then, and then up straight like up, yeah. 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 But no, I, I'm, I'm really confident that that's what we're dealing with. So it would seem we're now talking about a hill of two halves. The O'Neill Tower on one side. Looks like as if we've got ourselves a post hole. <laughs> <laughs> and the first evidence of the English fort on the other. Sometimes you get timbers stuck into the base of the bank like that. Mm. So it's like a timber wall and it helps hold the, the earthwork back. But sometimes you also get these things called, called storm poles, aren't they? That's Where it. they actually push the stake in at an angle like that. It's got a sharp point on the end, literally to stop you climbing up onto the rampart and you, you impale yourself. Oh. And the thing about those is that they're set into the bank at an angle so the post hole isn't sort of traditionally round like something that's set mm. upright. It's more kind of a, an oval shed. Potentially, we would have a line of these running all along this earthwork that's, then. That's what you kind of expect, yeah. It would have been a formidable palisade, and it gives us a good idea how the English stamped their presence on this hill nearly 400 years ago. In the settlement trench, work's progressing slowly but steadily. Oh, it's, wow. As you can see, it's our first bit of diagnostic piece of pottery. What date is it? Well, definitely in that 15th, 16th, 17th century oh, range. Right. We're looking at sort of settlement in rural Ireland with this stuff, aren't we? We're not looking at any English influence coming in. That's what it suggests, definitely, yeah. yeah. But there's still no evidence of an Irish cabin. And with the end of day rapidly approaching, we're also still trying to work out what's going on with these two walls in the castle trench there now appears to be a sizeable gap between them. A gap large enough that it could be a doorway. Oh, he's out. Oh, look at that. That is it, look. That's the other, that is a face. With a bit... Meanwhile, Phil's built up quite a rapport with this archaeology. Well, he's certainly on speaking terms with it. That one will come, well, you know what, he will come out. He'll come out with back, won't he? Let's have you out, you devil. Oh, wow, uh, that's noise coming. That is noise coming. That's spot on, though. I like that. So, looks like we've got the castle here, which is very nice. May have a doorway here, which would be great. Unfortunately, we don't yet know which way round the castle is. How do we find out? Well, if we get into here and we find a doorway there, then this will be the inside of the castle. But that's for tomorrow.
It's the beginning of day three and probably the best sunrise so far on this Northern Irish site. But while some admire the view, for others, it's what's in the ground that counts. Below me are the foundations of the Tower House, which 400 years ago would have been lived in by the O'Neills, the most powerful family in the north of Ireland. Originally, it would have stood this high, so it would have been from here that the O'Neill would have looked out on his dominion. And down the hill, we're trying to find some of that dominion. We're confident we're in amongst the original Irish settlement. But the first stone feature we uncovered here has turned out to be a drain from when this hill was a posh English garden. Finding an earlier traditional Irish cabin house is proving to be a frustrating process. It's just possible that we've got a structure there. What, that rectangular shape? Yeah, but I I'm not totally convinced, to be honest. Over in Rakshaw's Fort Trench, we've started to uncover evidence of fortifications built after O'Neill was defeated by the English. There's five metres. <sighs> so we're now extending the trench to uncover the full extent of the main defensive ditch around that English fort. Yesterday we were really excited because we'd found this tower house, except that we didn't know which way round it went. Don't chuck that earth on me. And we didn't know whether or not this was a doorway. Now, do you think it's a door? No, I don't think it is. Oh, let's just... No, 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 don't get despondent. There is very good positive conclusions from what we've, we've, we've seen this morning. Look, the, the crucial thing is, I think we are on the outside of the building. Why do you say that? Because of that batter on that wall. Get, get round there, you can uh -huh. see it sloping down. The batter is more likely to be on the outside of the building. It's yeah. at an angle, isn't that's it? Right, yeah, yeah, definitely. What we don't yet know is what this wall is, and I think that's probably going to be our big challenge today. What we need to be able to do is get down to see whether those two walls, whether they bond in together and are therefore yeah. part of the same building, or whether they butt up against and then might be, again, two separate phases of building. Yeah. We will only know that when we get down. So we've got to extend this trench to see if we've got two different buildings here. While Mick and Raysan are now trying to work out what Phil's discovery of an outside wall means for the layout of the site. But if you put Bartlett's tower on top of that, that isn't quite what I expected. <laughs> We've had real problems trying to tie Bartlett's drawing into the modern landscape. Changing it 90 degrees, it all starts to make much more sense with the topography. But with Phil's discovery that he's on an outside wall and a lot of head scratching and computery stuff, Mick and Raysan now believe O'Neill's tower house once stood here. In other words, slap bang in the middle of the hilltop which for a mere mortal like myself is rather confusing. What you're saying is very plausible, except that Bartlett says that at the end of his tower house, there's nothing but the edge of this promontory. Whereas as we can see, there's loads of stuff here. Yeah, but I think we're, what we think now is that this is being built up to form the base of the fort as they're developing the town in the 17th century. And of course that's after his time. So he's drawing it as he would have seen it, which is the castle area and then it drops away. We're seeing it as the castle area and then an additional platform put on for the, for the later fort. So all this wasn't here when O'Neill built his castle? No. Basically, this hill was a completely different shape 400 years ago, with O'Neill's tower house sitting atop a small hill overlooking a traditional Irish settlement on the slope below. And in Bridges Trench, we may have just found a rubbish pit, classic evidence that people once lived here. Tracy, can you see a cat coming up here from where you are? Oh, yes. Yeah? Yeah, it's I'm a lot darker, isn't it, on the other side? I'm not dreaming it. No. <laughs> That's all right. But for all the features and walls we're uncovering, it's one tiny find that's come up in the castle trench that's put us right in the middle of the events that changed the face of this hill forever. French. 
And surprisingly, it's the size of this pistol ball that tells us it came from the time of the 1602 battle. A bit small, isn't it? That's the good thing. The smaller, the better. This lead ball measures just a third of an inch across. It's a size that was popular with French and Scottish gunsmiths. We know that O'Neill had imported in uh, Scottish gunsmiths to make pistols at this site. So the bore of this pistol ball enables us to tie it in directly to O'Neill. If it had been any larger, there could have been doubt. But as the 17th century progresses, these pistol balls get larger. So this would be consistent with the size of the pistol balls being made to fit the pistols made by the Scottish gunsmiths. Because isn't there a story that I've heard that O'Neill actually imported lead from England, ostensibly to put on the roof of his house, and then he actually melted that lead down to make pistol shots? Yes, back when uh, O'Neill was still friends with the English, he'd got a licence to import this lead. But of course, when the war came, the roof was thatched and uh, the lead was used to make ammunition for O'Neill's men. It was, it was a pretty uh, backdoor way of, of importing armaments then. Well, you do what you can. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's the, it looks like the, the jaw of an animal. And you can see we've got a molar here with the root coming down. With just half a day left, Bridge has now found compelling evidence of the Irish settlement. Have you just found the top of a rubbish pit? Well, that's it, I mean. It would be usual to find something like animal jaws and animal bones and bits and bobs and, and rubbish pits. And definitely the fill is consistent with, with something that would be a rubbish pit. So we're, we're below the garden. We're with O'Neill. We do seem to be getting evidence of occupation. This solitary sunflower is actually a very significant marker for us because on that side, Phil's been chasing the tower house. Meanwhile, over here, Rakshar's been ploughing a very solitary furrow in this trench. What's been going on? Well, Tony, we've got this huge ditch down here, but we need to run up to the top to tell you a bit of the story. Yeah. What they've done is they've actually scooped out the natural to create that ditch and shoved it all on here. See this wonderful drawing? This is the first English fort built in the 17th century. Well, around this, there should be an earthworks with a ditch. And that's the ditch, and this is the bank. So <laughs> this is it. actually evidence of that fort? Yes, it is. These massive earthworks would have been just part of the English defences initiated by Lord Deputy Chichester. But surprisingly, it looks like the heart of this English fort was actually built on the remains of O'Neill's tower house. In effect, Chichester has a citadel in the yeah. centre of his defences. Yeah. And he's reused the foundations, perhaps, or maybe some of the walls of the old tower house yeah. for this, the heart of that. And he's added on his bastions at yeah. each corner. Mm -hmm. And then a great big massive amount of clay put in at the same time. Yeah. Uh, presumably as a gun platform or something. Presumably like as a gun yeah. platform. Yeah. The archaeologists are beginning to think that this mysterious wall outside the tower house is part of a bastion, a defensive gun platform. What actually starts to make sense is if that this tower house here has the stone bastions added immediately around it, yeah. and then on the outside of Chichester's fort there are earthwork defences. If the archaeologists are right, it means this this trench represents both the Irish and British history of this site. But this new English fort didn't bring peace for long. Within decades, violence once again engulfed the country. A process that has repeated itself again and again across the centuries. In 1641, things collapsed into violence. Uh, religious, bloody sectarian violence. And this was the 1641 rebellion which was, in some respects, the prelude to your own civil wars in England. And I have here some witness statements and some propaganda material uh, which show the divergent views of the time which historians now have to tackle. And we have here an Irish source. This is an Irish Franciscan diary of the time. For this man, it's also a religious war, a justifiable rebellion to eliminate the heretics from Ireland, to drive them out and to cleanse Irish soil of this contamination. In this case, not only did they uh, 
kill Protestants. They dug them out of their cemeteries. The activity against Protestants was vicious indeed. So there was a lot of propaganda going on. Presumably this is propaganda. What's going on here? This is the sort of English propaganda that was produced to bring Cromwell into the country, uh, to enable uh, the English to reconquer Ireland in 1649. This shows uh, English settlers have been stripped naked and turned out into the snow to die. So even today, this history is really controversial? Absolutely. And it's the responsibility of my generation of historians to look at this honestly and try to determine fact from fiction in all these divergent accounts. And I think if uh, the politicians can look with similar honesty in their work into the future as we're looking into the past, I think we have a chance in this country. And to find out more about the turbulent history of Ulster, visit our website. Over in Bridges Trench, we've managed to untangle 700 years of archaeology to get right back to the very beginning of the O'Neill's reign on this hill. We've actually come out with three phases of activity in the trench. Right. The latest phase is dated to the 18th century, and that really is gardens and landscaping and terracing on this whole slope here. But just underneath here, we've come down onto material that the pottery is dating it to the 16th century. Oh, right. So that's the O'Neill family. So we're actually looking at a settlement of that date, or a bit of it, on the side of the hill there. That's right, and unfortunately the trench has just missed it and it probably, the houses are probably just here. Right, right, right. Now down the other end of the trench where Tracy is, we're actually going back 200 years. So what have we got here then, Tracy? Oh, we've got these wonderful big boulders, look here, forming a revetment for the bank. And there's a second run down there, so you'd be looking at a stepped bank going down. And what sort of date is this then? We've got pottery dated to 1450. So that's taken us right back into the Middle Ages, in fact. Yeah, this could well be dating to the beginning of the O'Neill's office. <laughs> That's it, because we know that the O'Neills came here in about 1300s. Yeah. So yeah. it's as though when they chose this hill as their home, yeah. they're coming here and they're, they're constructing this double revetment for either fortification purposes or they're stabilising the bank yeah. to keep their home safe. So all the story in one trench, in fact. Yeah. Shouldn't have bothered with the other, should we? <laughs> These stone revetments mark the beginning of a dynasty's rule over the province of Ulster. A 300-year presence in the Irish town of Dungannon by the O'Neill clan, a rule that only ended with the beginnings of the British Empire. And back on the hill, we're now confident that our trench not only contains the O'Neill Tower House, but also some of the earliest evidence of that colonisation of Dungannon by the English. The crucial question this morning was just what the relationship was of this big lump of stone to the wall of the tower house, whether or not they were butted up or whether they were uh, all part of the same build. Well, we can resolve that now. We can now say that the wall of the tower house is, is of an earlier date than this piece of wall here. And you can see that when they've added this later piece of wall, there's actually a little tiny gap between the two. They couldn't quite get them meshed right up together. So the battered wall is the wall of the O'Neill Tower House. This wall here is a later addition. You can see it comes along and it turns and it goes that way. And we think that this is a bastion that was added by Chichester. So we've got the Irish fort and the English fort in the same trench. Two stories in one, yeah. So we now have O'Neill's castle a 13-metre-high tower house that would have dominated one of the most strategic positions in the north of Ireland. From here, the chieftain, later the Earl of Tyrone, could survey his kingdom. And perhaps from here, he watched the advancing English troops that were to change his country forever. And within years of O'Neill's defeat, this building was either remodelled or rebuilt into an English fort. The heart of a new plantation of incomers and a new chapter in the turbulent history of Ulster. And to think, if we'd been able to dig our trench where we'd wanted, we'd have missed this altogether. 
for the last 40 years, this hill overlooking Dungannon and most of the rest of Northern Ireland has been associated with masts and other police and army paraphernalia. And it would be good to think that the work we've done over the last three days, along with the local community and council and the local archaeologists, will help Dungannon reclaim some of its historic past. It would also be nice to think that our castle has been waiting here patiently all these years to be rediscovered by a new generation in the 21st century.